There's a million bacteria and 10 million viruses. In the air in this room, we've been doing the Air Genome Project. All of you just during the course of this hour will be breathing in at least 10,000 different bacteria and maybe 100,000 uh, viruses. Uh, so I would look closely at the person sitting next to you to see what they're exhaling. Uh, this, is the, this is the world of biology that we live in uh, that we don't see, where evolution takes place on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, not on the speciations of giraffes versus elephants versus kangaroos, but the tens of millions of species that constantly are affecting the metabolism of our planet. The air that we breathe comes from these organisms. The future of the planet rests in these organisms. And the question is, if we take over the design of these organisms, uh, does that really shift the balance in any way? Or is it such a small portion of what's out there uh, that will only affect industrial processes, uh, not the living planet? My vision of life is, in a sense, even more radical than that because I would like to regard the genomes of the giraffes and kangaroos and humans that you referred to as just another set of viruses um, in, in close-knit societies. So uh, the gene pool, I, I should say, of, of giraffes or the gene pool of humans or the gene pool of kangaroos is a huge society of viruses, I'm using the word loosely, I'm using the word viruses um, because um, the viruses you're talking about, the bacteria you're, you're talking about are kind of free spirits who are out there in the sea and out there in the air, but there's another whole class of them who have not agreed but who have come together in gigantic clubs, gigantic societies, which is you and me. And so, um, as far as a, a piece of DNA is concerned, there are just various ways of making a living, and some of the ways of making a living are floating around free in the air and floating around free in the water. Other ways of making a living are to club together with other bits of DNA, making a genome and influencing the phenotype, influencing the body in which they sit, to pass them on to future generations. These are just different ways of making a living. The whole of the biosphere is a gigantic collection of crisscrossing, interacting DNA, some of which jumps from kangaroo to kangaroo or from giraffe to giraffe, others of which, but via the normal route of reproduction, sexual reproduction, others of which jump around through the air or through the water, but it's all the same kind of stuff. In fact, the jumping, I think, is a lot further. Uh, they can jump from planet to planet. Uh, so we have organisms that can withstand three million rads of radiation. They can be totally desiccated. Uh, it's been shown that they can survive easily in outer space. We exchange roughly 200 kilograms of material between Earth and Mars each year. Undoubtedly, we're exchanging these organisms. Uh, so it's a question of how far they can transfer. Uh, we're starting uh, to look at the gels uh, from space dust to see if we can find DNA uh, in them. These organisms, if they were shielded within a comet, within uh, uh, any other material, the estimations that we came out of this conference could literally last tens of millions of years, uh, find a new source of water and start replicating again. So. So our viruses uh, can affect the universe, uh, not just, uh, uh, just not the girl next door. There's a precious beauty in, in the experiments you've just uh, been describing because Charles Darwin himself did just the same thing but with transmission of organisms from continent to continent. Darwin was concerned for theoretical reasons to argue that it's possible for living things to survive enormous long journeys in seawater. And, and, or, or uh, other transmission conditions. So Darwin did experiments very analogous to yours in which he, he took seeds and, and showed that they could survive for uh, long periods of time for long enough to drift across from one continent to another. It's a, it's a beautiful analogy. Well, in fact, the thinking, it was remarkable looking back at history as uh, Europeans went out to look at other continents 
they were expecting the equivalent of space aliens uh, on these different continents. So we, we, we seem to extrapolate much more in our imaginations uh, than we do in life. I, I'm certain we will find bacterial life on Mars, uh, whether it's actively replicated or not still is, is a question, but it won't differ from what we have on this planet. Because, it'll be because it will either have originated there and come here, originated here and been contaminated there. Uh, have you thought about exoplanets, uh, Dimitar, Sasilov? Yeah, uh, so uh, Dimitar says uh, there's uh, in our own galaxy 100,000 Earth or super Earth planets uh, just within our own galaxy uh, that could all support life. Uh, so I think we will find life as a universal concept. Anywhere we find highly intelligent life, I think we will find it's a design concept, it's an electronic concept, it's an information concept. Uh, we can transfer life across the universe as digital information. Somebody else could, in their laboratories, build that genetic code and replicate it. So uh, uh, perhaps publishing my genome on the internet had more implications than I thought. So your, your, your idea of when you talk about design, you're, you're inferring that life is a technology. Would that be well, life, life is machinery. Life is a, uh, uh, it becomes a form of technology as we learn how to engineer it and reproduce it. Uh, one of Richard's colleagues, Jay-Z Young, uh, at Oxford, uh, in his 1951 Wreath Lecture, said we create tools and we mold ourselves through our use of them. So if life has moved from reality to a tool, to a technology, uh, how is that going to change our view of who and what we are? <laughs> I was kind of hoping you would answer that. It's a question that's sort of come up from the beginning of looking at the genetic code. Uh, many argued we would diminish humanity by looking at our own genetic code and understanding it. Uh, that's a very simplistic view. Uh, I, I think from e even with our species looking at our genetic code and trying to understand how we go from the same 22,000 genes in every one of our 100 trillion cells to a John Brockman and a Richard Dawkins is far more fascinating than anybody can conjure up, I think, from uh, any uh, religious or poetic uh, uh, form. So I don't think it diminishes his humanity it to, to understand it. It sounds fascinating now. 25 years from now, it'll sound uh, to the next generation trite and uh, uh, taken for granted. Uh, things are going to change. Like with this scheme of things, I don't see any place for religions. Uh, I think we're going to relate to each other differently. Uh, it, the whole cybernetic idea is a, a huge epistemological uh, breakdown of our traditional ways of looking at, e at each other. We, we go down an empirical road until it hits a wall and you have to rethink everything. And that's where we are right now. I'm not asking you to do it, but uh, it's happening. Well, well, it certainly changes the definition of an internet virus. If we can have an actual uh, a virus digitize its code, we can transmit it around the internet and somebody else could build that, uh, that same one. Or more importantly, a, a cell uh, to make octane uh, from carbon dioxide based on sunlight. We, we, we need to get these transfers very quickly. Uh, we are a species that it, everything is out of sight and out of mind. Uh, while we worry about GMOs primarily